Brilliant. Okay, um, you might notice a slight pop music thing as we go along with this. I'll, I'll let you work out who it is. Um, I'm Adam Edwards. I am the agent manager for law, for science and technology. I support remote users. I do work-based learning and I do collaborative partners. So it's all those mixy things. So I felt I feel a kindred spirit here at Sheffield with, with ACE. So ours doesn't come up with an acronym. It's more like one of the maths, math acronyms, I think, really. Um, I normally do this as a double act with Vanessa Hill, so um, an awful lot of what's in here is Vanessa's content as much as, as mine. So hello Vanessa, because she promised to watch, so she should be logged in by now. Um, so, you'll notice the thing as it goes along. Um, I'm going to put this in the sort of context of actually what someone has been for us as a huge enabler alongside a number of other developments which have changed the approach we've taken to teaching. Uh, which has been quite exciting. And actually what Summer has done, the biggest thing Summer has done, is to free time up for us to do other things. So in a way I'm going to talk less about Summer as, as, as an object and a thing, because we've had a lot of that from other people, and I thought, I'll do something slightly different. But about the sort of way in which we changed our approach to teaching, and apologies to people at the Bible if you've seen some of the slides before, but Summer has enabled that change, which I think is a very good thing. Okay, so, um, I've talked about who I am. I'm going to run through some of the issues that got us to that position of that conclusion, the ideas we then ran with to do things differently, the solutions we've used, and how someone fits into that context. Um, and I brought some of the samples of the things that we use. Um, normally I get you to have a go at this, but it's not the right setting and there isn't enough time. But anybody wants to have a play with these at lunch time, come and talk to me. So, um, all right, the SOS. You worked out the group yet? Yeah. <laughs> Please don't sing along. No, um, it might be quite entertaining. Um, so the problems that we faced, um, the not embedding is kind of a cliche thing we have, isn't it? You know, that you'd like to have your sessions embedded, but more people to them aren't. Um, in the computing context, which a lot of this was driven by, um, the, the school had evolved this hideously complicated matrix where perm any four modules and you get a degree pathway which is brilliant, except that you're then trying to say, okay, which modules do we need to see the students on? Well, if you see CMT 1300, you see about two thirds of them. How do we see the rest? And well, some of them are doing it and it's hideously complicated. Um, so we weren't terribly embedded, and there wasn't a great deal of coordination going on. Um, it was therefore inconsistent. Um, we had a big problem with repetition, but I think the spectacular occasion was for the third time students say, but we've done this before, as we went on to what we thought was a new module, and it wasn't. So that was kind of embarrassing. Um, and also the problem with repetition of we then miss some people and you end up having to repeat things at the second year level because they go, we don't know this. And then you get that whole problem of mixed ability teaching. Some people don't know this is boring, going through that again. So all sorts of complexity going on with, with the provision of the teaching. So, so this is one of the problems we're grappling with at the same time of, of, of bringing things like summoning as well. And then usual things of timing, um, lack of information. So I love this assumption that computing students somehow know to search. I had a learning problem. I've done, I've done a PG cert HE recently. We had this big professor person come in as the last seminar to sort of give us his wise, wise words of wisdom. And he said, of course, computing students know all this because they're information literate. And I said, excuse me, no they're not. They know how to press shiny buttons and they think they're really cool, but they don't actually know how to do any searching any better than any other students, which is kind of useful because it makes you think, actually, I know the way that these people know as little as anybody else. Um, and then the other issue for us is around the traditional librarians' approaches of, Yes, by PowerPoint, and let's do yet another database. And, you know, it all gets a bit sad and boring. Um, I'll move on. We didn't move on. What's happened? Try that. Something's. Probably on SOS. <laughs> oh, we're, in, we're back in business. Hooray! Yes. Um, this, is, this is kind of you know, a slightly sort of pushing the boundaries take on library teaching. But I think it can be true. And, and again, some of these things come out. We spend far too much time being generic. We spend far too much time teaching the tools. And of course, some of those people have already said, and I'm going to make the same point later on, is that you know, it frees you from that endlessly going through how to use different tools. We spend far too much time in didactic, of course, where, you know, do this, then this, then this, and follow that instruction, and you don't use that, you're not breaking, whatever it's up. 
you know, that, that sort of, you know, an uninspiring, dull teaching, you know, come on, let's do it different. And I think part of that is driven by fear. Actually, I'm terrified that if I do something where the students might be able to give me a different answer than what I'm expecting, that actually that makes me really worry because they might ask me something I don't understand. As librarians, as teachers, we're teaching information skills. We're not teaching them the subject. And actually, I found it really liberating personally, that whole thing of actually saying to people, just you know, go away and find something out. And it comes up with something different and wacky that you're not expecting, and you run with it. And actually, that's OK. But also, because at the end of the day, you've made it clear that they're going to find stuff that you've not expected. You've kind of signaled that you may not have a ready answer or a ready response from them. So don't be frightened in your response to that. OK, so um, the Bajorn again thing is, I know it isn't a song title. It's the, it's the rival group, but anyway, it fits. Um, this, this, is, this is the bit Vanessa always does. Vanessa went to a very inspiring session run by Sharon Marcus. You mentioned Sharon Marcus, and Vanessa didn't to do this. She's probably doing this back at her desk right now. Um, we spend far too much time cram stuff in. You've only got them for an hour, so we'll teach them everything we can. No. Quality, not quantity. Less is more. Don't try and turn the student into a mini librarian. They didn't sign up to be a librarian. They don't want to be a librarian. Just, you know, it's, it's, it's not about cloning. You know, they don't need to know about Boolean operators. It doesn't matter. Let go of it. Discussion is incredibly powerful. And actually, what our teaching is around is getting them to talk about it amongst themselves and talk to us about it. Because if you get people discussing and the learning by doing, you get into that whole thing of activating their prior knowledge, bringing that to the table. And if you can align their prior knowledge, their prior experiences and the stuff you're teaching them, it's never constructive alignment and it's the sort of methodology we talk with PG Sir H E and yes, that's a success. Um, and it's about learning. It's not about I tell you how to do this, it's about let's work it out together. And of course games is a brilliant way of, of making that work. Now, again, Lilac, fantastic, 2011, I went to one and I went to Susan Boyle's session. Susan Boyle's at the University College Dublin. And um, she did a hands-on workshop on how to do games. And it was all those light bulb moments. You see, okay. Why the hell, after 20 years in business, haven't I thought of this one? You know, <laughs> but hey, you know, you can repent of your sins and change. So, okay, we talk about games, but actually it's about constructing activities that are fun and are quick and are simple and easy, but actually are about provoking the activity and making the students the students speak. I mean, so, for example, I mean, you'll see these sets of cards. They're just sets of cards. They're just laminated bits of paper, you know, printed on a color printer. Um, if you've got a library assistant who, who's displeased you greatly, give them a little anime potential. Um, uh, I have to ask Andy very nicely, and it involves pints of beer, if you need some more of these being done. Um, but it's not about creating a game that's a game in itself, it's about making the students talk about it. Um, so that's what those are there for, and I'm so grateful to Susan for inspiring us um, to do this. Now, although these are generic games, of course, because the students are discussing it in the context of the work that they're doing, and you frame the discussion, you get them to talk about, well, how does it apply to your project? Actually, the discussion is the important thing. That's just an enabling tool that gets them talking about it. Um, OK. So it's, this was a lovely quote I found at the PG cert. Um, you know, the students see their normal work as lifting and transporting textual substance from one location of the library to another of their teacher's briefcase. To searching, analysing, evaluating, synthesising, selecting, rejecting, all those things that actually is the meat and heart of information literacy. You know, people talk to worry about the evaluation side. And that was a very big theme that right at 2012, when everyone was saying, it's about evaluation, it's not about the searching. And I absolutely, absolutely concur with that. Whilst all that was going on in terms of thinking, the school were looking at employability skills and how do we map what we do against the employability skills framework, because that's the thing that the senior management were getting very excited about at that particular time. And so we saw that as an opportunity to fit what we did, and also working very closely with our colleagues in the learning development unit, that's academic writing and numeracy, to say, OK, how do we fit the school plan and the school structure? And that's very powerful, because you can say, hey, look, we're addressing those employability skills you're supposed to address. So if you let us in, you're addressing those employability skills. And for some lecturers, that's enough to make them go from, well, not really, to, oh, OK, then, you can have them for, for a couple of hours and you can do something. Um, we produced a menu of, of sessions, okay, um, and that um, was our way of saying there's different bits and pieces that we can use and chop and change to fit what you need. So it doesn't have to be two hours, it could be half an hour and we'll just cover two things. 
but it gave people a sense of the things that we could do. And in that, I guess the employability skills got to be up. So if you like, before Sun, we had the complexity in computing of three different databases, all with three different interfaces. ACMs is not very good. Um, you also have the problem that people miss things, you know, psychology of computing, computers and education, which are other databases you don't necessarily get. And we have the dull confusion thing I talked about earlier, where people are having to learn three different interfaces. We do start to look at the separate databases when we get into the second and third year, um, but we, we don't do that the first year, so we just teach summer, because that then enables us to do the finer stuff, the evaluation and the synthesizing and all that sort of business. So, summer, what's it done for us? It has saved time. That's been the biggest thing. I don't have to teach three separate databases. I teach one thing, and that frees up the time for discussion. We also then use the time saved to do, do games about the different resources and stuff. We also use the time saved to do an exercise and getting them to think about the keywords. Think about searching before you plunge in, um, because that's really quite important. And when you have a lightning session, you'll be having a go at just what we do for that. Um, we do have a go. We say, try it, see what you come up with. Um, the best example of this was CMT 1300, when they are doing the interactive systems thing, looking for e-ticketing systems like Oyster, the Oyster Club. Oyster. Now, the students own, that was really quite powerful as an example of, they made a mistake and they learned from it. So we weren't giving them a perfect search to follow, we were letting them make mistakes and they collectively learned from that experience. Every time they mentioned Oyster Ice Cream, it's kind of memorable. So, it inspires confidence. There's only one place I have to look. It's like Google, so I kind of know where I'm coming from. And it's all very straightforward. And what we then do is to say, and it's better than Google because. We don't say, you know, use Google, but we have a better than Google, how it compares with Google, to sort of compare the things it does and where it's better and where maybe it's not so good, just so they've got a sense of where that would be. Right. So, in the context of our teaching, we do a thinking about resources game, which is that one. We do the keywords thing you'll see this afternoon. We do the search and using some, and we get them from a, a blank stream through to generating a reference. Even the most skeptical student loves the references, because because I, I had a famous famous one, that is very sick man, because they're from North London. You know, that is that is like the ultimate compliment. You have to wear your trousers round your bottom like that if you're in North London and you're male. Very scary on the library staircase. Um, and obviously, you know, we then follow this up with evaluation and thinking about the sole use of that may not be considered an academic resource. Okay. And we did a survey of the second year students and hey, guess what? We also attended our sessions and used some got better marks, it was quite nice. And they use some of the ones who didn't attend the session got use the library catalog too much. In the case of this particular project, that was useless because what they were looking for was stuff related to a project that they needed to use newspapers and they weren't going to get them through the library catalog. And I love this thing that you know, the ones who attended got the idea of academic authority, and the ones that didn't thought they'd be easy to read was the most important, one of the most important criteria for finding something. Maybe says something about our students. So, where do we go from here? Uh, we go on and on and on, as the song says. Um, we're rolling out our, our framework, we're developing activities, we keep on coming up with new ideas for little card games. Um, so we're, we're pushing this through to the second and third years. As part of the revalidation that's been going on of the lots of the computing courses, we've been pushing really hard to get our learning objectives in to give us a look. Vanessa, myself, and Paul Berlusquina, we're now listed as tutors on CSD 4040, which is the, the Masters in Computing course. We are tutors for all the, all the bits of the, bits of all the modules, which is brilliant. The frightening thing now is you've got four lessons to plan and lots of hours to fill, but hey, that's an exciting problem to have. So it's, it's kind of working in the embeddedness. So, summing up, um, we've done a lot of changes. They have made a huge difference to the way in which we do things. Somebody earlier said about the whole thing of if you use the discussion, see what you find, it's much more fun. It stops you going brain dead um, than, 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 than um, you know, if you, you're following the same thing each time. It saves time, it gives you the freedom to do these things. But we keep on pushing, based on the survey that we did, that if you do all this and you use summon, you get better marks, and then that kind of helps sell it to the students. So, mamma mia, that's the end. Yeah. There are some references at the end, which give me an excuse to get another out of song in. Um, any questions? Everybody wants lunch. Yeah? Talk a little bit more about the, the, the games we have, the games, were they the end of an hour or were they most of the hour or? Um, well, take this one as, as an example. Um, I'll just 
hold it up, you've got the journal, you've got more. This is, you know, replaces that sort of, we have different types of resources in the library we'll need to use them. We simply say to them, okay, sort these cards out in groups of three. You know, definition of a book, what it's good for, what it's not so good for. But actually, the finding of that information out, most of it they should know. But it does give us a useful common based kind of understanding. It mentions things like peer review, so we get to the students and say, well, what does peer review mean? And so rather than us telling them as a series of slides, they're working this out, they're sorting the cards out, they're finding out themselves. That card sorting game plus the feedback takes 15, 20 minutes, something like that. It's a small percentage of total time. The other great thing, it's kind of an icebreaker, it gets them used to the idea that they're going to have to talk and interact with us. It also helps with the inevitable late arrival of students who, who, who have left it a bit late. It kind of helps cover for that too. So it's, yeah, it's a small one. You don't really want any one activity to be too long. Um, so, the, so the sum of the searching, we probably spend no more than 20 minutes on going from a starting searching to generating a record. And that's it. Uh, and then we move on to other things. Yes. Um, well, the biggest was running it, running it with the librarians at Milo when there were 60 people in the room. I think it a bit noisy. We normally, we normally have this just at the computer students in their lab groups. So we've normally got 25, 30 of them. And we make them do it in groups of three. So you maybe got seven, eight, nine, ten groups going on at any one time. So it, it kind of keeps it. Keeps you focused. And again, the working in the groups is important. It's not individual people doing individual stuff. Computing students much rather be individuals on a PC. And it's, it's, it's making them talk to each other and discuss stuff. And it's deliberately designed to provoke them into, well, actually, I don't agree with you on that one. So discussion is powerful. Um, so are you getting more and more education? Or is it just that? We've started within science and technology. So the question was, are we doing this across the institution? Others of our colleagues have taken these and have adapted them and used them in, in different areas. For example, um, this initial set here, um, one of our business librarian colleagues has added in business market research reports, so another category for the search that, that has used it. And different people have used different, different things in different ways, depending on what fits them. So it's not a sort of one-size-fits-all change to it. It's We've developed our particular way of doing things. And we have been very lucky. I should say, we're lucky because ACMI, Trevely, computer source sort of, most of what we need to teach is covered by some of them. The problem some of my colleagues have in other areas is, particularly those where we're dependent on the EBSCO-based resources, they're much less keen on some of them. So they're much less keen to use it. Um, and so they don't teach in the same way. But hopefully they'll be converted to the course one thing. Okay. Thank you.